In section 5.2, we introduce the definite integral and work with some examples involving this concept. So first we see the definition of a definite integral in the first box on the page. If f is a function defined on the interval a to b, a definite integral of f from a to b is the number given by this expression right here. So this will be read as the integral from a to b of f of x. So in other words, that's the, uh, that will be an area interpretation in just a moment, but it's the uh, limit of the uh, max of the delta xk is going to zero as k, from k equals one to n of uh, f of xk star times delta xk. So that's a pretty complicated formula, clearly, right? But what we see is that this leads us to split the interval up uh, somewhat freely, right? Instead of using even subintervals like we did in the past, and said n goes to infinity. Well, now all we really want to do is take the max uh, subinterval length and make it go to zero. So that way, all the other subinterval lengths will go to zero as well because they're smaller than the max. And we know that as our subinterval lengths go to zero, we get infinitely many rectangles. Essentially, that's the same as squeezing in or running in off to positive infinity and squeezing our rectangle widths down to infinitesimal zero. And uh, we multiply our height times our width for our rectangles. Xk star is a point uh, within the interval or within each within the kth subinterval. Maybe it's a midpoint, a left endpoint, or a right endpoint in each of those subintervals. So this gives us a very general definition of a definite integral, and we'll probably work with something more specific most of the time, and particularly when we talk about uh, you know, more advanced tools for calculating the definite integral, and perhaps when we uh, establish those theorems. So if it does exist, so if this limit exists here, then we say that f is integrable, right? So if this limit exists, it means that when we're done evaluating it over here, we have some number, right? And well, that means that our integral was equal to that number. If that's the case, then f is said to be integrable on the interval a to b. So there we have it, uh, the integral of a function and the classification of it as being integrable. So our next theorem or subsequent theorem here is that if f is a continuous function on a to b, or if f has only a finite number of jump discontinuities, interesting fact, then f is integrable on a to b. That is the definite integral from a to b of f of x exists. Okay. For now, this is the differential dx as we've always known it, but we don't really read that when we look at the integral. Um, the integral from a to b of f of x dx we might read, um, but or this could also just be the integral from a to b of f of x with respect to x might be another way to read that as well. So uh, that's nice to know. If a function's continuous, then it's integrable. Even if it's got jump discontinuities, non, you know, finite jump discontinuities, so it jumps some finite distance from here to here, right? So here, we might have a function that looks like, let me sketch something to serve as an example here. It might look like this. there, right? That's a finite jump continuity, jump discontinuity. The jump distance is less than infinity, right? Some measured amount. Um, it's not an infinite con discontinuity, like a vertical asymptote or something along those lines. So um, continuous functions are integrable. So that's nice to know. And also remember that differentiable functions are continuous. Thus, differentiable functions are integrable as well. That won't really be as important, but it's a uh, it's good to realize. Okay, so moving on, let's uh, let's dig in here a little bit closer. So if f is integrable on the interval from a to b, then its integral from a to b is equal to well that same area calculation we did back in five point one. This is a really nice theorem to have because before that general x k max stuff we were talking about down here was really threatening to confuse the issue. This theorem cleans that back up for us, and it tells us that 
the areas that we were calculating previously in section 5.1, well, they're actually called these integrals from A to B. This will be called a definite integral because we have the definite endpoints A and B. Now, um, so now we've basically just given a name to this expression that we used back in section 5.1. And we can also note that delta x is B minus A over N and xk is A plus K times delta x. So any one of our intermediate endpoints for our subintervals is calculated by taking A plus whatever K endpoint we're talking about times delta x. So those are all the pieces we really need for one of these problems. Now, the difficulty is evaluating these limits. So this one actually goes um, backwards and we're not asked to evaluate the limit. It says express the limit as a definite integral on the given integral. Okay, so, well, so the area here is given by limit as n goes to infinity from k equals one to n, the sum of cosine of xk over x sub k times delta x. So we need to kind of tease out what information is what here. And they're telling us on the interval pi to two pi. So delta x is built based on pi to two pi. So that's good to know, um, but it's, closed in here, and that's the general formula for delta x. Our, remember that our formula looks like this on the right-hand side. Basically, what the problem's asking us to do is to go from the right-hand side over here to the left-hand side, express the limit as a definite integral on the given interval. So there we have it. Delta x is this. Whatever's left over in here is probably f of x sub k. So it looks like f of x is cosine x over x. So that'll be my integrand, is this is what we call the function inside the integral. Delta x we can think of as cleanly swapping with dx. We'll have more on that later. So delta x and dx match. Now the last thing we need for this integral notation is the interval, pi to 2 pi. Well, we go from pi to 2 pi, and there we have it. So that's how we would move backwards. And this is just a conceptual question to, to go from this side to the left-hand side. But these are reasonable problems to see in web assign or, or quizzes, perhaps. And so, um, so we've gone with the right-hand side and picked apart the pieces to identify what this is as a definite integral. So when I see this limit of the sum, or the limit of the Riemann sums, this is sometimes called, then I look at this and realize that uh, you know, this integral is telling me that I'm interested in the area of under the curve cosine x over x from pi to two pi. There we are. Now, um, that's just a simple conceptual question. So let's move along and see what else we might encounter in this section. Um, we'll need to make use of these trick formulas. I talked about this in the previous section, 5.1, when we calculated an exact area underneath the curve. So I was a little bit out of turn to talk about it then, but nonetheless, here we are in 5.2, speaking about each of these three different formulas. So these are nice tools to have, and I'll and we'll see where they turn up and how to use them. This one's telling me this, that the sum of the first n integers, k equals one to n, and k equals one. So when k is one, we add one, plus k equals two is two, plus k equals three is three, and so on. So that looks like this. So if we add up the first n integers, stopping at n, where n is some positive whole number and a positive integer, then it's actually equal to this formula here. So these, are, these formulas are nice so that we can substitute out the sigma notation, write a formula involving n, and then apply our, uh, well, sorry, formula involving n, and then apply the limit to whatever the results are. Okay, we've already seen this one. That was the previous section, but I'll just remind us this was one squared plus two squared plus so on up to n squared. Just repeating what this sigma notation tells us to do. K scrolls from one to n, incrementing all along the way. And this one's actually also one cubed plus two cubed so on, right? And we see that these aren't really 
two different, they're just different cases of uh, analogous situations. This is the sum of the first n cubes. This is the sum of the first n squares. And this is the sum of the first n integers. So there we have it. Um, now, the most important part is going from here to here. What I've wrote, written in the notes off to the side is just, well, that's just to recall how sigma notation works. What we really want to know is if we have one of these, how to get rid of the sigma notation and write it as one of those, right? One of the rational expressions on the right. So here's some things about sigma notation. It has a running index variable, k. K starts at whatever this value down here is, and it ends at whatever this value up here is. Okay, those, so those will generally be two different numbers. A lot of times this will be n for us, and we'll be taking the limit as n goes to infinity. As long as that matches one of the formulas up here that we're using, then that's just fine. But note this about sigma notation. If c was a constant, then we would just, we plug in k equals one to this formula, there's no there's no k in there. There's no independence. There's no dependence on k. So this is just c is the output. When k is two, c is the next output. When k is three, c is the next output. And sigma says add up c and then add up k equals two is c and then add up k equals three is c. And if we do that n times, we'll have n c's added together, and n c's added together is n times c. Okay, so one example of that, maybe the student can pause here and have a look and think it through. K equals one to 10 of three. This formula does not involve K, it's just a three. So when K is one, the formula says, okay, add three. When K is two, add three. All the way up to when K is 10, add three. There are 10 threes here. Add 10 threes up, that's three times 10 to get 30. So that's an example of that situation. So not only that, but we can also, if we have terms a sub k, right, some function of k here, and we have a constant c times them, well, we know that we're going to multiply each term by a c. We can factor c out of all of those terms, right? So this is really similar to something like this. c times a1 plus c times a2 all the way up to a sub n. This is another version of this, right? Another way to write it. All of these are C, all of these terms have a C in them, so I could just multiply it in this fashion. Factor the C out and then multiply it by the sum of those A sub I or A sub Ks. Okay. Um, similarly, I can split a summation over a sum, right? for finite sums, this is absolutely true. I'll let you write a similar example off to the side here, or you can look it up in the textbook. Uh, differences, very similar. Um, they can be thought of as a combination of the two rules above. So the two nice facts to have about sigma notation, or a few nice facts to have about sigma notation, or summations as we might call them. Okay, so now let's use these tools to solve some problems. They ask us to evaluate the given definite integral. This is the integral from 0 to 2 of the function x minus 2x cubed with respect to x or dx, right? So really, we want to know the area underneath this curve from along 0 to 2. So we know that this is going to be the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum from k equals 1 to n of delta x times f of x k. That's the formula. You write that down right away, understanding that you're going to need to fill in the details here. So again, let me just remind us, when we have a definite integral, it's equal to the limit of the sum of f of x k times delta x, right? And that's exactly what we've just done based on that statement. Now, we need to know some of this information. We need to know what f of x k is. Well, f of x is x minus 2x cubed. There's our function. We need to know what delta x is. Well, delta x is b minus a over n, 2 minus 0 over n. So what we see here is that delta x is 2 over n. So that's good. Next, we need to build up x1, x2. We really don't need these terms. The one we really want is x sub k. Because if we know what x sub k is, we can just plug it directly into f's expression here. 
and we can work with that. But maybe just to motivate how these turn these values, these in, subinterval endpoints come together, we kind of did a little bit of practice here. Remember, x1 is a plus one times delta x. x2 is a plus two times delta x, two times delta x. x3 is zero plus three times delta x, or a plus three times delta x, so on down the line. x sub k is zero plus k times delta x. Or in general, remember that this formula, write a general version of it here, xk is always a plus k times delta x. That's the ruling formula right there for all of this. The only one we need is this one because our expression, so x sub k is 2k over n because our expression only asks for f of x sub k here. That's the general term. That's sort of the recipe for cooking up all the terms that go into this function. Delta x we've calculated as 2 over n, and x sub k we've calculated as 2k over n. So I sub both of those in on this subsequent line here, and I have 2 over n times the function evaluated at 2k, n, 2K over n, um, limit of the sum. These operators are just going to ride along with us until we're ready to start evaluating them. So f of something is that something minus two times that something cubed. So let's see what we have here. Here's 2k over n, the something, minus two times 2k over n cubed. I've cleanly substituted my argument term, 2k over n, into the function f. And that's what it looks like, x minus 2x cubed, this form right here. Now I want to simplify this. Okay, combine like terms however I can and work from here. So what's happened in this case? I've got 8k cubed over n cubed times 2. So that looks to be, oh, I've actually multiplied 2 over n into this as well. So this is minus 4 over n times 8k cubed over n cubed. That's just this term right here taken care of with this factor in the front. Now, for the other term, the less complicated term, this times this, gives me 4k over n squared. So now we've got that as well. And it looks like we might want a common denominator here. Um, we have n to the fourth down here. We have n squared. We'll have to work this out as we go along. But what we know is we can split over differences if we like. So maybe we don't need that at all. It turns out if we look a little further down the line, no, we don't actually need that. We're going to split this, this, this difference right away. Okay, so again, holding the limit still, we're not ready to try to evaluate the limit. That's our last thing to do. We want to work on the sums, these sigma notations. We want to see if we can break these apart and get them into a position where we can apply one of our rules about sums of the first n integers or functions of the first n integers and uh, get rid of the summation altogether. We're not ready to take the limit until we've simplified summation. So to that end, this sum, 4k over n squared, minus this sum, 4 over n, 8k cubed over n cubed, all comes out to 32k cubed over n to the fourth. So simplify between those two to see that we get this expression. And now we split our sums. All of this, by the way, is within the limit here. And well, n squared and 4 have nothing to do with k. They're not the rolling index, so they're constants, and they factor out in front of this summation. The same thing for 32 over n to the fourth from this summation. And what we're left with are two summations that we can simplify pretty nicely, each with a constant times that summation. So if we look back on the previous page, we know the sum of the first k integers is equal to this, or sorry, the first n integers, stopping here, is equal to that. And the sum of the first n integers cubed is equal to this expression. So we sub both of those in for the summations. Notice their constants are still there, right, for each of these. 
but we're able to evaluate the summations just thanks to this trick that we have involving sums of integers. All right, it doesn't always work out this way for integrals. That's why we'll have other tools in the future. But for these problems, you just need to learn how to make these steps and just simplify to get to one of these states, one of these summations, and then immediately substitute it for what we know it to be equal to. Okay, now it's a matter of simplifying between these products and then possibly getting a common denominator in the end here. That's the time we probably want that. And then ultimately taking our limit as n goes to infinity. Notice at this point that there are no factors of n, there's no instance, or sorry, of k in any of these terms. That's good. K is supposed to be gone because the summations are gone. It's only n's left. And we're only going to deal with the limit as n goes to infinity as our last evaluation. So all of what happens between here is a simplification. Okay, and it looks like when we get down to the end of it, we're taking the limit as n goes to infinity of this minus this. And if we look, n squared over n squared, that's going to be a 1. n squared over n squared, that's going to be a 1, the leading terms of both of those rational expressions. So I have 2 times 1 minus 8 times 1, and I get negative 6, interestingly enough. Okay, now you might want to take some time and make sure that you simplify all of these, you follow these lines and see how they simplify, but there's nothing going on here other than algebra. So it's not particularly interesting. Um, but nonetheless, make sure you understand what happens there because, of course, you need to be able to do these steps to get down to here. Now, what does a negative 6 mean? We're talking about the area underneath this curve. Well, it turns out, this is a reasonable time to introduce this, the area between a curve and the x-axis, we're going to refer to it as signed area or potentially net area is another term we might use. So what it means that it can be negative. If the curve happens to be below the x-axis, then that's going to give us a negative area. So it looks like this thing must have been, at least for some time, below the x-axis. And I'm just making up what this looks like. So down here, it contributed a negative area. And here, we got a positive area. All right, so that's our idea of signed area. So this is a negative area, and that's a positive area. And we add them together, the net area came out to be negative because the negative one's larger than the positive in magnitude. And that's what we got maybe a negative six. Or perhaps the whole function's underneath the x-axis the whole time. And it was just negative all along. So nonetheless, these are net areas. And we might find that they're positive or negative um, or even zero um, when we calculate these definite integrals. So there we have it. Um, Let's move on. We can also use geometry, if we're quick enough to see it, to evaluate the uh, a definite integral that's given to us. And in this situation, for these cases, the main one you're going to see is the following. You're going to see a linear function in the integrand. So negative 2x is a linear function. And we're asked to find the area between it and the x-axis from negative 1 to 2. And, well, we don't need to do all the tricks. It might turn out, and maybe it's worthwhile to try this as an exercise, is to set it up as the limit of the sum, as the summation, of f of x times delta x, and work out all the details and find that it does actually equal what we're going to find below. But what we see here is, well, if we graph this line, and let's remember some things about it. Um, when I plug in zero, I get zero. So it passes through the origin. That's a good thing to know. At negative one, it's left endpoint. F of negative one is negative two times negative one is positive two. And then F of two at its right endpoint is negative two times two is negative four. So we go from two to negative four in Y values. And that's the point negative one, two, and two, negative four. So I plot those points with the origin on this graph. And maybe I don't have to plot it, but it's pretty helpful to plot this actually. Since it passes through the origin, it kind of simplifies life a little bit. It's easy to see what this distance is. It's easy to talk about what this length is along the x-axis. So this is the length of one, right? Base of one. 
this is a height of two, right? So this is the area of a triangle with base one and height two. And similarly, this is the area of a triangle with base oh, two and height negative four. Now we're gonna use that value of negative four here. Remember area is signed. So it's a negative length right here. I know that might not make sense, but uh, abstractly, this is uh, just how we'll do this each time. So the area of this triangle is one half negative four times two base times height or height times base. And this is going to be one half. Area one is going to be one half one base times height two. And below we can see all of this worked out. Area one plus area two is the total area between this curve or line in the x-axis. Here's a one, here's a two. When we add them up, we get negative three. And that meets um, what the graph's showing us. We have a negative net area because we have more area that's under the curve than we do above the curve. So, or under the x-axis than we do that's above the x-axis. So we always talk about the area between the curve and the x-axis. So that's what our integrals do for us, our definite integrals. So geometry can help us out sometimes. Had this happen, it's, maybe this is a circle, right? Circle centered at the origin, something like that. We could also use geometry if we're given a function in here that happens to be the upper half of a circle. It would be something like a, a square root of four minus x squared from negative two to two. And we know we are dealing with the whole semicircle and we can find its area, the area between it and the x-axis. So uh, geometry can be helpful, but it's not going to solve all our problems. So let's move on and learn some more rules for approximating these areas or these definite integrals, okay? So the midpoint rule is one of our most accurate approximation rules. Well, it's the most accurate approximation rule that we'll use in this course. And what it is, is it says the, the definite integral is approximately equal to, and this is the sum f of x sub k bar, now this bar means we're taking the midpoint of each of our n subintervals times delta x, right? So this is height times length again to get areas of each of these. And instead of using an endpoint for x1, we'll use x1 bar or x k bar is the midpoint between the two subinterval endpoints. Okay, so let's remember some things. Delta x still b minus a over n. x sub k is still the general, a plus k times delta x. That's how we churn out our endpoint values for our subintervals. x sub k bar is the midpoint. It's the mean of these endpoints. Okay, so we'll see this. It's the midpoint of, so that's our calculation, the midpoint of xk minus 1 and xk. So let's see all of this come together here. So we're asked to approximate the definite integral by the midpoint rule with n equals 6. All right. Well, here we have it. We're going to go from 1 to 4. The function's going to be 1 over x squared, and this is our definite integral here. So we have a equals 1, b equals 4, n equals 6. We can calculate delta x right away. So it's 4 minus 1, or b minus a, over n. And that comes out to 1 half. Next, let's calculate our endpoints. We're going to go, we're going to use six subintervals. So we're going to go from x0 up to x sub 6. Remember that x0 should be a. When I plug it into this formula, if k is 0, then I have 1 plus 0 times 1 half. So I just get one. Of course, that's equal to a. Now I can keep applying this formula. x1, remember a is 1 here, so x1 is this 1 plus 1 times 1 half, or 1 plus 1 half is 3 halves. And then we could do one of two things. We could keep applying this formula, or we could realize, oh, well, I'm just going to add 1 half for every one of these increments, so maybe I'll just do that. So 3 halves plus 1 half gives me 2. 
Again, you could use the formula if you like for k equals two in here and you get the same value. But we move on. Two plus a half is five halves. Plus a half is three is three. Plus a half is seven halves. Plus a half is four. You can check the details of that on your own. We landed at four for x sub six. We're going to do six subintervals. We're at four. Four is b. So this all checks out. I'm happy with the subinterval of the endpoints that I put together here. Now with left or right endpoints, we used to use um, all but one of these endpoints, depending if we did left or right endpoints, to calculate or to approximate the area underneath this curve. For the midpoint rule, I'm going to use all of these zero x0 through x6 endpoints because I need the midpoint between x0 and x1 between x1 and x2, between x2 and x3, and I'm going to call those midpoints x1 bar for x0 and x1, x2 bar for x1 and x2, and so on until I get to x6 bar. Okay, and the way to calculate that was given in the formula at the top here. That's this midpoint formula that was shown. Now, underneath the line of midpoints, shown to us is one half times x1 plus x0. So that's our first line underneath the midpoints uh, heading. So this is, well, x1 is three halves and x0 is one. So that's one half times three halves plus one. So that's five halves times one half is five fourths. And you can see the next line, x2 bar, one half times x2 plus x1. Well, x2 is 2, and x1 is 3 halves. Add those together, and you'll get 7 fourths. And we go on down the line, and we might even see that there's another little trick that we can do. The midpoint from x1 bar to x2 bar is a length 1 half away, a, length, a delta x away from the previous midpoint. So to go from 7 fourths to 9 fourths, we could just add one half. Well, one half is two fourths. So we can go to nine fourths for x3, then add two fourths to go to 11 fourths for x4, and so on, so forth down the line. 13 fourths to 15 fourths for x bar, x6 bar. Okay, we have all of our midpoints lined up now, and we're ready to input them into the formula. And this is really the easy part. We've done all the, the legwork. Maybe applying the function to these midpoints could be a little bit of work too. So that's the one over x squared component of this um, for each of our xk bar midpoints. But nonetheless, that's just plugging numbers into a function. So we're ready to use all of our midpoints that have been generated here in order to calculate m6 or the midpoint rule with six subintervals of this integral. So that's really the easy part. We just apply it according to the formula delta x times f of each of the midpoints um, x1 bar through x6 bar. Here we are. And we plug in 5 fourths for x1 bar, 7 fourths for x2 bar, and so on down the line until we get to 15 fourths for um, x6 bar. Now, f is one over x1 bar squared, right? It's a, a one over x squared. So in all cases, we're applying the function to the midpoint value. Okay, when we simplify those expressions, what we see is that all of these denominators had underneath them a denominator of four squared so they all come up as a factor of four squared in the numerator, and they can be factored out of this expression altogether. So that's four squared over two, or four squared times one half. In the lead here, and we have one over five squared remaining, one over seven squared remaining, and so on down the line until we get to one over 15 squared. And maybe we can square those numbers out. Um, of course, there's a lot of work here to put together a common denominator for these. But we could plug this into a calculator and get some reasonable decimal approximation. If you were asked to do this on a test and leave an exact answer, this would be just fine. Getting this common denominator is a whole lot of work. So uh, that would be unreasonable. Maybe if it was just three or four uh, subintervals, something like that. Okay, so that's the midpoint rule. It's uh, applied similar to the left and right 
endpoint approximation rules only. You have to do an extra step here of calculating the midpoints. But remember, there's a nice shortcut. Once you get x1 bar, you can just add delta x to get the rest of these values. Remember, delta x was 1 half or 2 fourths. So um, that's midpoint. No properties of integrals. Some other useful things that we can use uh, that will come up for us is the following. So if we integrate a constant function from A to B, that constant function being C, then the result of that's going to be C times B minus A. This is any constant C. Um, details for this, we maybe work out uh, in a live meeting at some point, or you can check out the textbook to see the proof of each one of these things. But these are fairly straightforward concepts to, to, to work out. So we can split the sum of the integral of two functions, f and g, as the integral as the sum of the integrals of each of these functions. Notice it's the same interval, a to b, that we start with for each. So that's important. But otherwise, it's nice to know we can split these up. That's inherited from the limit law for sums. Remember, limits define these things. So we can split um, sums of or integrals of sums as sums of integrals, all thanks to the sum law for limits. So we can factor out constants from these as well. C times the function f of x factors out of the integral altogether would be just as follows. That's also nice to know, and that also comes from limit laws. Differences from the limit laws. And now we've got one thing that doesn't come necessarily from the limit laws, and this is the following. If we integrate from a to c, f of x dx, plus from c to b, f of x dx, and we notice function f of x is the same, the integrand is the same here, and the right endpoint and left endpoints match, then we can say, well, rather than stopping at C and then picking up another integral and going from C to B, we can just integrate from A to B all together. And moreover, what that tells me I can do is if I have this side and I know that C is a number between A and B, well, I can clip my integrals into two pieces and calculate from A to C and then from A to B, and I can add them together. This will be a useful tool for us um, at certain points in this chapter. And here's a picture of that, right? Here's the integral from A to C of y equals f of x, the area underneath the curve here. And then we have from C to B is the area from here to here. And overall, of course, that's equal to just finding the integral from A to B of the whole thing and one integral f of x dx here. Okay, so that's a nice, and here's where we're clipping between those two integrals on the interval. On the interval. Okay, so uh, use properties of integrals to evaluate the integral. So now we're getting a little bit more succinct in the way we handle these things, a little bit more tricky, right? So uh, we're asked to evaluate the integral i equals zero to one, negative two x squared plus three with respect to x or dx. So um, now, the first thing I can do is split the sum inside here as the sum of two integrals. A and B are the same, right? I'm using this rule here, second rule. Okay, A and B are the same in, in each of these, and the functions are negative 2x squared and positive 3. Right? So, I can now factor out this constant of negative 2. And that's using, I think, the third law, or third rule, sorry. There's a third part of the theorem there. And this, looking at 3dx, what I realize I can do is 3 is a constant. This is not a function of x. It's a constant function. So its integral is given as 3, the constant c, times b minus a. Well, b minus a is 1 minus 0. So here we have that. So both of these are by rule 1 and, and 3 of the theorem. Okay, so this part's dispatched. We don't have to integrate anything here anymore. We just have a number, all right? And then, well, if I look at this, this is very familiar. We did this back in section 5.1, actually. It's in the notes there. And we found that the integral from 0 to 1 of x squared dx is equal to 1 third. And this is sort of a slick, uh, cheating way to get around it. But if we've already done the work and know what the value is, we might as well just do it. What we do know is that we can go back and find this 
the way that we did back in section 5.1. So if you haven't already done that, then you should do that with the limit of the sums and so on. Uh, notice that trick only works because we're going from one to zero to one, just as we did in that example. Even by changing the limits of integration here, or the interval that we're integrating on, is the other term for that, then uh, we'd have a different value that comes out of this. But nonetheless, it matched, so we can use that rule. It was one third in the previous uh, examples of the previous section. So there we have it, and we end up with uh, these two numbers to some, uh, add together, and we have seven thirds as our value. And it looks like we can conclude that our function negative two x squared plus three is integrable on the interval zero to one. Okay, we probably could have concluded that anyway, because this is a polynomial and polynomials are continuous on all of their domains. So this polynomial is continuous on zero to one. And if a function is continuous on its interval of integration, then it's integrable on that interval. Okay, so another round of this. They give us some information. Assume that the integral from 0 to 5 of f of x is equal to 8. And the integral from 0 to 3 of f of x is equal to 5. And they say use properties of integrals to evaluate the integral from 3 to 5 of f of x. This one's interesting. They don't give us a function here, but they give us a suspicious amount of information, right? They want us to find the integral from three to five of f of x when we don't know f of x, but we at least know two facts connected to that. So what I know is this. I know that the integral from zero to five is the integral from zero to three plus the integral from three to five or I've written this in another way, right? I'm using my last property up here, okay? But what I see is this, the integral from three to five of f of x dx is the integral from zero to five of f of x minus the integral from zero to three of f of x, right? And that's because I can add this term to both sides, right? And I'll go from a to c, zero to three, and then c to b, three to five, and that'll take me from a to b, zero to five, okay? We don't always have to use this formula in its given form here. We can add or subtract terms from one side to the other, okay? And that's exactly what's happening in this case. So it turns out the integral from three to five is this eight from this integral minus five from this integral, and we see that it's three overall. So that's nice. One other identity that we're gonna come across in the future, just to keep an eye out for, is if we take the, the definite integral of a function f of x dx from a to b, if we flip the order of the limits of integration, or this interval of integration, then it makes the integral negative. And we'll see why that turns out to be the case later on, but that's just another interesting one to keep around. That might be helpful um, to have as a preview for this section. Right, comparison properties of the integral. So um, if f of x is greater than e or equal to zero, so, uh, you know, what we're gonna say is that suppose all of the following integrals exist. So anytime we express an integral in here, uh, that integral actually exists, okay? So if we have a function f of x that's greater than or equal to zero for every x value on a to b, then the integral of that function on that interval will also be greater than or equal to zero. So in other words, if we have all of our f values are positive, then our integral values should be positive as well. Okay. If f of x is greater than or equal to g of x on the interval a to b for every one of those x values, then the integral of f of x will be greater than the integral of g of x on a to b. Um, if f of x is greater than or equal to m and has a lower limit of little m and an upper limit of uh, capital M or lower bound and upper bound of M and capital M on A to B, then the integral of this function from A to B is greater than M, the lower bound times B minus A, and it's less than the upper bound capital M times B minus A. So there we'll have uh, 
a nice result for us to use going forward. The picture of this is as follows. Here's a uh, y equals f of x, an interval a to b, just a sketch of this. And we see that m is this height, and that seems to be the max value of this function on the interval. Remember, use the closed interval test if you need to. And lowercase m, the minimum value is here of this. And it must be that the area of this function is greater than the area of this rectangle, right? The area underneath this curve is greater than the lower one, right? That's m times b minus a, little m. However, the area underneath this curve is also less than the area of capital M times b minus a, the area of the upper rectangle. So we know that its area, the area of the, or the definite integral a to b of f of x for the area underneath this curve is actually in between those two. And that's exactly what this is telling us. This is in between those two values. So um, now let's use these properties again to evaluate um, another integral. So we have the integral from one to two of one over x squared dx. Well, they're actually not asking us to evaluate it. They're asking us to estimate the integral. Okay, so we're gonna use to the best of our ability what we've got right here. So we've got, uh, we know that one over x squared, if we think think this through with the closed interval test, we wanna, we wanna realize what's the maximum of one over x squared on the interval one to two. Well, f of x is x to the negative 2. I take its derivative for the closed interval test. f prime is negative 2x to the negative 3. We see that this is negative for any positive number I ever plug in, right? So this function is decreasing on the interval 0 to infinity. So f is decreasing since its derivative is negative for any values in that interval. So it has a maximum at x equals 1, right? I could go looking for critical points, but you'd have to realize, or you could see quickly, that if you set this equal to zero, there are no x values that solve that equation. So there are no critical points. At least there are no um, derivative being equal to zero critical points. So, um, and we know that this function is well-defined on all positive values, not including zero, of course, because it's not positive. Um, and not, um, and it's decreasing, so it has a maximum at x equals one. It's decreasing, so its max has to be on the left, right? Its min has to be on the right because it's decreasing. So its minimum values and maximum values are as follows. It has a max of f of one, since that max is at one, that's equal to one. One to the negative two is one. And down here we do the same. The min is at x equals two, and that's f of two, which is two to the negative two, which is one fourth. So that we've got our max and min values. This will be uppercase M. This will be lowercase M for our max and min values for the function, our bounding values of the function. Now I can say the following. I know in general that for this integral from one to two, one over X squared, it's less than or equal to its lower bound times two minus one. And it's, sorry, it's greater than or equal to that. And it's less than or equal to its upper bound times two minus one. Well, what's its upper and lower bound? Well, its lower bound is one fourth, its upper bound is one. So I know that this integral, whatever it actually is, it's between one fourth and one. So I have a good estimate of this integral. And we'll use this technique later on to prove a pretty important theorem. And uh, we'll also see it in some exercises just to get used to these concepts. So uh, there it is. That's a comparison properties of integrals. And that's actually our last step for the definite integral. Really the bulk of this section is actually doing problems like, well, the midpoint rule is gonna have a, a good share, but we're gonna have quite a few that are these sort of rigged problems that seem to work out um, just like this one did. That uses one of these sort of trick formulas here. So just keep an eye out for that and then practice with the conceptual questions involving the properties because of course that'll help us to understand integrals in a way that we'll need in order to do well um, with the end of the course here.